Our field of 68 off the carousel series heads to North Carolina A&T with the new head coach at A&T, Monty Ross. He's back in the CAA, where at Delaware, he was the coach of the year in the league in 2014, won the CAA regular season and tournament titles to head to the NCAA tournament. And Coach Ross, it's, it's great to have you with us here. I tell you what, uh, seeing you get this opportunity is absolutely awesome. Why North Carolina A and T for you in this stage of your career? Well, you know, I think. Well, th first of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, and it is great to be back in the uh, CAA, uh, a league where I cut my teeth at as a first year head coach for ten years at Delaware. But you know, for me right now. Um, you know, North Carolina a and presents a, an, an opportunity that uh, is really, really unique. I think the the uh, prospect of being in, at, at HBCU, uh, the number one HBCU in the country, and having an opportunity to play in the CAA, uh, a league that obviously I'm familiar with, I thought it was a, um, a, a can't miss. And, and, you know, having a lot of familiarity with North Carolina, have gone to school at Winston-Salem State, which is, shoot, 20, 25 minutes from uh, A&T. There's a lot of familiarity with the area in terms of recruiting and that sort of thing. So, again, it, it, there was a lot of natural uh, fits for me, a lot of boxes that were able to be checked. And um, so, it, so it's been good. It's been a really, really good fit so far, and I'm uh, really enjoying the challenge that we have ahead of us. Tell me about the the process uh, because you're obviously with uh, Coach McKee and and Temple, and uh, you're there from 2019 to to this past year of of North Carolina A and T reaching out and and how things came to fruition of of sort of you becoming the leader of this program. Well, you know the funny thing was, you know, you you. you people to call you and tell you about uh, what's going on on Twitter and that sort of thing. And uh, somebody texted me actually and said, Hey, uh, now this is probably two or three weeks left in our season at Temple. And someone texted me and said, Hey, good luck with the uh, A&T job. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what, what you're talking about. And he said, I saw on Twitter where you're one of the five people that they're mentioning. I said, I have no, I've had no contact with A&T. They have had no contact with me. And furthermore, if I was interested, which I'm not, uh, that would be the kiss of death if you're one of the first five being mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was really comical. So then, you know, you <laughs> fast forward to the end of our season at Temple. And, you know, when, when we got, when, when things ended at Temple, I was, you know, comfortable, not, you know, whatever. I was just, you know, I told my wife, look, we'll stay in the area for another year and then we'll, you know, we'll go down South and, uh, you know, enjoy ourselves. And, um, but on the ride home, ironically enough, I got a phone call from a gentleman who I consider is like a godfather to me. And, you know, he said, well, what's going on? What's happening? And and I just said to him jokingly, uh, well, shoot, man, I have to go get this A&T job now. And he was like, are you interested in that? And I was like, and I started to think about it. I was like, I never thought about it before, before but... Yeah, yeah. So, you know, long story short, I did. I sent my uh, stuff in, um, and uh, I was able to, you know, for lack of a better term, be sifted through all the other candidates. And uh, lo and behold, here we are. That's amazing. I mean, the the Twitter storyline there, one of the first five names <laughs> mentioned. You're right. That's how these searches go. If you're one of the first names mentioned, that typically never goes that way. Never goes that way. 
<laughs> does that not make you think in in, in this world and, and you get to be a leader of young men uh, of just everything happens for a certain reason absolutely positively um, there's a a place and a space you just have to uh, bide your time and if it's for you it's going to happen um if it's for you it'll happen in due time uh always like the i love the saying that i stole from someone man plans and god laughs you know you just you you never know what's what's in store for you um but again it's, it's just the allure of a and t was just it was too great for me not to uh pursue and consider you're a Philadelphia guy, right? Yes. Philadelphia guy. And through and through, born and raised. <laughs> so the the natural question is, well, who made you fall in love with basketball? But you can almost, at least from my vantage point, I can start answering it by, by understanding that you're a Philadelphia guy. Tell me about that and, and what the roots mean. Well, for me... I think it started in the Sunny Hill League. Um, growing up, playing in the league, going to watch games in the league, there was just an affinity there um, that I developed for the game. Uh, being around people who were just so genuine and their love for the game won and their care for you as an up and comer youngster that took an interest in the game. There was, it was so, and I hate to say it this way, it was so pure back then. And we've lost a lot of that purity uh, in these days, in this day and age. I just had guys that wanted me to make sure I made something of myself, wanted me to, uh, use education as a vehicle to get wherever you wanted to get. And that was, you know, it was ingrained in me um, from a very, very early age from probably, I guess I started playing in the league maybe in uh, seventh grade, I think it was. Um, so from that point on, it was always use an education, use education and it was just people there who just cared about you. And when, when you start to develop relationships and you start to hang around people that have positive motives, that have no ulterior motives, uh, it, it allows you to grow. It allows you to blossom. And that's what the Sunny Hill League did for me. And, you know, the people that were involved with the league really, really cared for you. And, you know, I, I think that's what made me fall in love with basketball. And I think to an extension, that's what made me fall in love with coaching. I look and see that for 10 years, you were at St. Joe's as mm -hmm. an assistant. Uh, how would you identify what Phil Martelli means? You know what? He... Obviously, he's probably my one of, if not my best friend in coaching right now. Uh, we still communicate and um, converse with one another. But what he taught me was invaluable. He taught me that every single thing you do has to be for the betterment of the young men that you're in charge of. Uh, and that's everything from soup to nuts, uh, in and everything you do. It, it was an understanding that you're in charge of someone's pride and joy. Hmm. So you must, you have a responsibility to make sure that they're taken care of, to make sure that you're looking after them in every single aspect of their lives basketball, uh, classroom, academics, uh, social life, uh, all those things, all the things that make up a college experience, 
you're in charge of, you know, making sure that they have a, 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 a good one. And he was sincere uh, about everything that he did being for the betterment of the student athletes that he was in charge of. And I took that to heart. And I think that's what allowed, that has allowed me to, uh, has allowed him, first of all, to be so successful um, in his career and has allowed me to have some type of staying power uh, to be around the game for as long as uh, I've been fortunate and blessed to be around it. it it's always, uh, it's not about you. It's always about what you can do for others and how you're treating uh, the ones that you are uh, in charge of. That's awesome. That's as, as awesome stuff. Great reflection. Monty Ross, our guest, the head coach at North Carolina A&T. And Monty, let's talk about your team, the, the state of your roster. So every coach has that different story of the takeover and the opening months and the nonstop nature of the job. What was that process? What has it entailed over the first couple of months on this job? And how would you break down the way your roster shapes up for the upcoming year? Oof. Well, it was a whirlwind. Um, I brought a couple of guys down with me for the press conference, which was on April 13th, with the understanding of, look, we'll go down for a couple of days and, you know, come back, grab some stuff, and then, you know, try to settle in down in Greensboro. Well, we came down on the 13th, and I think the first time – I went back home it was probably uh, maybe the end of May. Uh, every time we got ready to go back home or to go back to Philadelphia to grab some stuff, there was always something else to do. There was always one more thing to do. So we could never, uh, we could never go. Uh, we had, when we arrived, I think we had nine scholarships and 10 games to get. Uh, wow. So the two most difficult things in college basketball, recruiting and scheduling. And we were bare at both spots. So, you know, I, I give credit to my staff. They just put their head down and, you know, we've been able to grab uh, some guys out of the portal. We've been able to grab some uh, high school guys late. and. We've been able to complete our schedule with the exception of one game uh, that we're waiting to finalize. Uh, so we, we've, you know, but kudos to those guys. There's no way I could have done it by myself. Uh, I have a good group of guys that are uh, working alongside me and we're, we're working hand in hand to, uh, again, make sure we're giving these student athletes the best experience possible. Who can we expect uh, to stand out for your team? You know what? I have no idea. Uh, we, we've we've had, what, 11 practices thus far. Uh, all of them have been ones that you can hang your hat on somehow, some way, except the last one that we had, which was absolutely flat out awful. Uh, it made me go home and not sleep at all that night. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think one of the things that we're going to be, we're going to be a team that's going to play defense. Uh, we're going to be a disciplined team. We're going to take care of the basketball, hopefully. Um, we're going to play unselfish. I think there's some things that you can do that doesn't take a whole lot of skill level. It takes a whole lot of will level. And hopefully we're instilling in these young men the will of playing the game the right way, the will of being a good teammate, the will of communicating to your teammates on defense. All those types of things, I think, will lead to us being um 
being on the road to respectability, being on the road to building uh, what we want to build here at, at, at North Carolina a and You said it. You take great pride in being at an HBCU and, and it being at, at a great one at, at that. We don't have enough black coaches in college basketball, black head coaches. It, it's It's been an issue in this sport. It's one that's been discussed. Uh, I'm, I I want to know from you how how much it means to you that you're a leader of of men on the sidelines and uh, what you make of of just continuing that mission in the sport of of being able to give minority coaches the the right amount of of opportunities that frankly uh, white men have got. Well, I think. And, and that's a great uh, question, John. Um, one of the things that I did when I was at Delaware is I always felt that I had a responsibility to lead in a certain way, lead my team in a certain way, lead my life in a certain way. I always thought that, you know, if they get me, when I say get me, if they let me go, um, it wasn't going to be because I was doing something I had no business doing with a student. Uh, I wasn't doing something I had no business doing in terms of drinking and driving. Uh, and the list goes on. Um, because I never wanted them to be able to say when another candidate Right. A black candidate came around. Well, we're not hiring you because Monte Ross did this or Monte Ross did that. They may say that you know I didn't win enough games or something like that, but they're not going to say it was off the court behavior uh, as to the reason. And we did happen to win a lot of games at at Delaware. But I always had those things in mind that I have to be an example and a leader because I want to set the table for the ones that are coming after me, just like John Chaney, John Thompson, uh, Todd Bozeman, uh, Bruiser Flint, all those guys that were head coaches before I was, Black head coaches, set the table for me to be able to have an opportunity. So that was always my thinking in uh, my role as a head coach at Delaware. Now that I'm at North Carolina a and it's really the same thing, except now I get more calls from younger coaches asking me, uh, what do I have to do to become a head coach? What do I have to do to get in coaching? What do I have to do to be a good assistant? And I'm always lending uh, willing to give advice always in terms of that. Um, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is, and I heard someone say this, um, I'm not sure where, Black coaches have to be allowed to fail. It doesn't make you a bad coach if you get fired. You know, and I think that's been the narrative for so long is if you get fired from a position, uh, that's it. That's it. Where, like you mentioned before, those are some things that white coaches don't have to always go through if they get fired. There's another opportunity that they can get. Uh, it's not a stain on their resume that can never be washed away if they get fired. So that's the other thing for me that black coaches have to have to be allowed to fail. And then in failure, we grow, we grow and we become better. Uh, but a lot of times those second opportunities don't come along for us to be able to show the growth that we have, um, show the growth that we've gone through, the process that we've gone through to get better. 
um, and, and improve our craft and improve ourselves and improve everything around, uh, because I, I think you can always get better. I think you, if you're a, if you're in this game, you can always get better. You can always learn. And the day that you stop learning, I think it's the day that you are shortchanging the student athletes that you're in charge of. What do you, thinking about that, what do you, Monte Ross, still want to prove? Not prove, I don't think. Um, I think it's just, I want to show these young men that I'm in charge of, I want to show them how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, how to be a good coach, how to be a leader. These guys are going to one day, the ball is going to stop bouncing. Now, they never think it's going to stop bouncing. They think they're going to play this game forever, but the ball is going to stop bouncing. And I want them to be able to look back and say, you know what? I appreciate the way that I was coached. I appreciate the way I was led uh, under Coach Ross and his staff. And one of the most thrilling things to me is when I, my, my former players at Delaware reach out to me and say, hey, coach, I'm doing such and such. Uh, coach, are you coming to my wedding? Coach, hey, I'm going to send you a picture of my, my son. Those are the types of things. Those are the reasons why uh, I love this business. I love uh, my association and my uh, having the opportunity to affect the lives of young people. It's just for those types of experiences that you get. And that's the same thing I want to do at a and Like we, we'll be the teams and the players here will be linked for forever. Uh, hopefully we're linked with the championship. That's what we want to build to. But even if we don't, the experiences that we have here will always be linked. And they'll always know if I do my job, they'll always know that they'll have a resource in me that they can confide in, reach out to, whatever the case may be. I'll always be there for them. For the rest of their lives, it doesn't stop once they leave campus. Once they leave the program, it doesn't stop. It's it, it's I'm going to be a resource for them uh, for the rest of their lives. Hmm. Monte, you you talked about spending time in the CAA. Now the North Carolina A and T Aggies are are entering year two since joining this league. Looking at this conference. I didn't envy any of the first year members last year because look who was at the top, a, a Charleston team that almost beat San Diego state who went all the way to the national championship game. Towson loaded with experience and, and talent Hofstra uh, with what speedy claxon has been able to do up there. You're not in, you're, you're not in a cakewalk by any standards. You are in a challenging league. Uh, how would you assess it? You're, I think you stated it uh, correctly. It is a challenging league, and it's a challenging uh, task that we have ahead of us. But, you know, I like to think I can draw on some of my experiences in the past. When I got to Delaware, George Mason was coming off of a Final Four. Wow. Um, when, you know, at Delaware... VCU went to a Final Four for Shaka Smart. Uh, Anthony Grant had those guys going before then. Uh, so I've had some experience in this league with some really, really great competition, some great coaches. Jim Laranega was at George Mason at the time. Like I guess said, Anthony Grant was at VCU, then came along Shaka Smart. Uh, so we had some unbelievable uh, coaches in the league. And the same thing now, you know, entering the league, you have like, you know, some of these guys, Speedy was an assistant. Speedy Claxton was an assistant when I was the head coach at Delaware. Uh, and uh, Pat Scurry at Towson was in the league. Bill Cohen at Northeastern was in the league. So, you know, there, there's some guys that have had unbelievable staying power 
uh, because they're terrific coaches. And, you know, coming into this league, uh, it's going to be a battle every single night. When you're facing guys that understand how to win basketball games, uh, it's a battle every single night. But it's one that I'm really looking forward to. It's one that I'm really uh, going to hope that our players look forward to because it has it makes you be at your best every single night. Monte Ross, congratulations on the opportunity to lead the North Carolina a t Aggies. We look forward to seeing you this upcoming year, and thanks for joining us on the Field of 68s, off the carousel. John, thank you, man. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Our partner for today's episode is Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 during the college basketball season, and I loved the impact that it had on my energy levels. I'm a big coffee in the morning guy, but by the time that the afternoon would hit, I needed another boost. AG1 helped me tremendously, especially on those days when I didn't want to get up off the couch and go hit the gym. Their tagline is, AG1 is comprehensive health and the power of habit in one. And man, that could not be more true. It's nearly impossible to eat and drink in a healthy manner in the month of February and the month of March when you are in my business. And AG1 was exactly the supplement that I needed to improve my gut health and cover my nutritional basis for the day. I've continued that into April. I've continued that into May, and I'm going to continue that the rest of the summer. All I have to do is mix a scoop of AG1 with some water or maybe add it into a smoothie and I'm ready to go. Do it after lunch and you'll be ready to go for the rest of the day. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com backslash field68. That's field68, F-I-E-L-D, the number six, the number eight, and you can get yours now. So check it out and help support this show. Thanks.